a Ratio Marketing Podcast. Have you ever wished you had a healthcare provider on speed dial? Someone you could call to validate your product market fit. Someone to listen and help you see your solution differently. Welcome to Healthcare Market Matrix, a podcast to help you see your market clearly. We dive deep into the challenges faced by healthcare organization leaders that technology has the chance to help them solve. It's all about gaining the kind of understanding you need to effectively connect with your market. Join us as we explore the healthcare market matrix. Welcome everybody and we are glad that you're joining us here today for Healthcare Market Matrix. And today we have joining us in our studios is none other than the incomparable Laura O'Toole. And uh, you know, Laura and I have known each other for a number of years, and I'm just excited to have this conversation because uh, there's a lot that Laura's bringing to the table. She currently serves as the CEO of SureTest, and I know we're gonna talk more about what SureTest is and does, but to give you some broader context for Laura, I just don't know another person who's had more broad-based exposure to the world of healthcare enterprise IT implementation than she has. I mean, she comes to us with more than 30 years of experience and so has definitely seen fire and rain and even knows who wrote the song that that phrase references. (laughs) Um, she spent a lot of her career as a global consulting professional, strategically designing, developing, and implementing transformational projects in the healthcare provider space. And so she knows operational transformation, and she's got deep expertise in human capital leadership, in client engagement and success, and I could go on and on, but I'm going to let her fill in some of those gaps here in a few minutes. So Laura, welcome to Healthcare Market Matrix. Thanks, John. As always, it's great to be with you and to talk to you. And of course, thanks for aging me. But the truth is the truth, I guess. <laughs> well, and, you know, we got to wear that as a badge of honor, right? Because we do indeed experience. Experience is a valuable tool in the crazy waters that we're navigating these days in healthcare. So we got to we got to own it. Yep, indeed. So. Take us back a little bit and in, in, into your journey into the healthcare and, and where what where you are now. So what how did you get into this? How did you find yourself into this world? You know, I found myself working in healthcare right out of college. Um, I had the opportunity to run the front end of an emergency room and then a business office and really more on the back office operations financial side of the house. So came up growing up working in hospitals. And then I'm sure you remember back in the day when Y2K hit and everybody was worried (laughs) about all the systems and what was going to happen when we flipped the switch. And um, I had the opportunity at that point to really become a traveling consultant. I don't know if you remember the old McKesson suite, um, the star product. So, you know, back in the day, I was um, a patient accounting star guru expert. I think I think uh, McKesson used to say that I knew more than a lot of their employees. So that's kind of how I grew up um, on the implementation side after I was doing operational work in hospitals and then became a road warrior, traveling consultant, running projects, managing big projects. Um, and my career kind of went from there in terms of, you know, client management, um, you know, overarching client responsibility, delivery responsibility for some really, really large projects, um, primarily around the implementation space. And um, I spent a little bit of time um, um, certainly working for many companies. I worked back in the day for First Consulting Group, which was, you know, in its time, a a lead niche healthcare IT consulting firm. And, you know, from my perspective, one of the best out there, of course, acquisitions happened and moved on, worked on my own, and then, um, you know, was the uh, chief people officer and COO of another healthcare consultancy. Um, and from that, uh, we spun off um, SureTest and I'm now the CEO of SureTest. But like you mentioned, you know, kind of did a little bit of everything, primarily on the implementation and client delivery um, side of the house, though. 
Yeah, so very deep experience in that interface between solution providers and the hospitals, health systems, the organizations that are implementing those solutions. Um, tell, t take us into SureTest now because that's the, the, the new hot thing um, and just a tremendous solution that's meeting a real need. So introduce us to uh, how, how SureTest is situated. Yeah, well, SureTest was born really out of a service offering in a business unit in a larger consultancy that um, we owned and ran, and we saw the value that our clients were getting, so we spun it out as its own company. But SureTest essentially is an automation capability to test all the workflow end user experience of the EHR, really any health, any um, any system application, um, certainly on the enterprise level. It's an enterprise level tool uh, and library and proprietary library of automation that gives our clients an immediate jumpstart to take the many times up to 30,000 hours of manual labor that our clients in the health delivery space spend on testing and regression testing their electronic health record in any application really in, in their enterprise applications and SureTest takes those manual processes and moves them to automation in a managed services capacity so not only do we automate and develop all the automation we maintain it ongoing for our clients so it's evergreen and stays fresh so ready for every new upgrade, SU, optimization, et cetera. So it was really important to us to launch this solution because we wanted to deliver something to our clients that had a meaningful ROI and provided real value. And particularly at this time in the staffing crisis and what our clients are dealing with, be able to give them back time, energy, and allow our clients the opportunity to work on more strategic projects than testing. So we take that headache completely away. Yeah. And it's a tremendous, it, it's just such a tremendous savings. And at a moment where resources for health systems are at a premium, you, you know, there's no substituting the, uh, there's no way to underscore the importance enough of being able to redeem clinicians time and get them back on the floor, mm -hmm. uh, help make IT resources go farther, be more efficient. All of that right now is absolutely critical. And uh, SureTest is really at the nexus of that. I'm, I'm very curious, Laura, knowing that you've lived as a, a professional intermediary for a long time between solution providers and health systems. Mm -hmm. um, and now you've moved into the solution, you know, onto the solution provider realm. What's been some of the biggest realizations that you've had in that, that move? What, what's the difference between, you know, the consultant role and, and really working to connect the dots for organizations and now moving into the solution provider? Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, you know, if you're a consultant or you're doing consulting work or staff augmentation work or you're coming in and just working on a project, you know, my biggest struggle with that whole landscape, and the, although I did it for many years, is that you go in and you help a client for a period of time, but a lot of times you take the information with you and nothing Nothing ever gets left for the client, in my opinion. You know, when you're thinking about either straight staff augmentation, and certainly there's huge value add in helping in that implementation and getting them to where they need to go. But I think when you bring a solution and a real managed solution that can literally give them back 300% in an ROI and make a difference for their staff day in and day out, and when they look in the rear view mirror, it's doing it over time. And when you can deliver something that you know works and you're so confident in the delivery that you can deliver it at a fixed fee price, that to me is real value to a client. And I think, um, you know, those of us that are in the market that are really trying to listen to our clients' needs and bring full solutions that solve a specific problem 
is what it's about. And I think it's really important to meet your clients where they're at and listen to them and understand what the biggest pain points are. And I think that those solutions that are solving a pain point are the ones that have the, the chance of winning. Yeah, we hear that very frequently in this in the context of the conversations that we're having. First of all, super important to have a very clear, well-defined, well-articulated value framework. You, you've got to know what value you're really providing for the organizations that you're talking to. And you have to know the organizations you're talking to, which is a problem for marketing, right? Because right. we want to come, come up with one big message that sort of blankets the whole thing. And every health system, every hospital, every organization around healthcare is slightly different or a lot different. And the ability to kind of frame and tailor those messages to really meet the specific needs or the challenges that an organization might be facing is an important piece yeah. and, and figuring out how to, how to discern that and how to target those messages effectively ends up being, ends up being really an, an important component. Um, what is, as you look at how you have um, learned to, to listen, as you've learned to uh, get around those problems and solutions, any insight or any, uh, any suggestions for organizations trying to figure out how to how to zero in on that value proposition and how and what they're going to be able to to bring? Yeah, well, I think what you said is really important. You absolutely have to have a very clear message, a clear value proposition. And this day and age, especially when you look at the struggles that um, our healthcare partners are having and and all the budget constraints that they have. You have to have a demonstrable ROI and you have to be able to help them see the path to get there. I think that's yeah, probably- not a vague, not a vague or ROI, a very specific, measurable, well documented, measurable, measurable, measurable ROI. ROI. Um, I would say that's the first thing. I think that the second thing is, is that you need to be very sensitive to the pressures that our clients are feeling because it's, it's nothing like nothing I've ever seen in my 30 years of, of doing this work. And you have to walk into it saying, how can I make this lift lighter for them? What can we do? How crisp can our methodology be? You have to have a very clear methodology and implementation strategy around your solution. And you know, for us, it's been really important to have a client success manager along the way from you know, even through the sales cycle out to the other side of success, mm -hmm. that really is a conduit and a liaison to help them help themselves get coordinated enough to get you as the um, solution partner, the information that you need, because typically it's not that much that you need from the client, but their time is important and you have to recognize how important their time is. So I think listening, having a good methodology and a framework um, in order to get the solution quickly implemented so that they can start seeing the immediate value is is really important. Uh, we have to help so let's not talk. kick the can down the road, if you know what I mean. Let's dive deeper in the methodology because I think that that's an important thing and something that I often see missing. You know, it's it's one thing to have a solution, <laughs> but it's not enough you have to have a very clear idea of how you're going to apply that solution in a multivariant context in context that could look a number of different ways and so you have to have a methodology that is going to accommodate that to help ensure success talk a little, talk about that some and how have you done that with SureTest and how have you and what are some suggestions you would have for organizations that are wanting to to bring that forward in a way, you know, maybe farther up in their messaging and how they're approaching things in ways that would help inspire confidence. Yeah, I think you need to be able to demonstrate through technology how easy it is to connect and get people engaged. So I think 
you know, and John, you and I have talked about this before. We've talked a lot about COVID and what that has done to the industry. But in my opinion, for healthcare, the one thing that COVID did is made us as an industry move and move faster. It, it used to take us as an industry, in my opinion, so much longer to get things done. And we had to learn very quickly that you don't have to see, touch, feel every person and every widget right in order to be to be successful and so on the heels of that we had the opportunity to really do some creative things because so many of our colleagues are either working from home you know the days of the big brick and mortar um, even if even clients that have hybrid approaches they're not there all the time so i think you have to have a very clear documented framework on how you're going to engage and i know that seems so simple but just the ins and outs of the technology you know, our entire solution can be delivered completely remotely. Um, you know, clients don't want to go out and engage as much as they used to. We're seeing more of that. So you have to find ways to connect um, with your client in order to move the needle to get what you need done in order to get the solution deployed to them. So you know, the tools that are out there and what you can do, even with things like Teams and Zoom and, you know, sharing folders and sharing information and checking in and out documents um, really makes a huge difference. And having that clearly outlined in your methodology step by step and making sure that you've proven it, you've tested it before you engage with the client so they see the confidence and your ability to execute and deliver is very important. Such a good point. Laura, I, I can say so many ways I've learned this personally, and I know that it's it's echoed in what I, I'm hearing you say. Don't assume things. Don't assume knowledge and familiarity. You're dealing with a group of people who are absolutely inundated with systems, processes, you know, frameworks that they have to somehow assimilate, internalize, understand, and carry forward. They don't have capacity for all of it, and they don't know what you know. And you have a tremendous, as a, as a, provi a solution provider, you have a tremendous bias. We talk about it here a lot. You, you have a familiarity bias that, that basically it's ubiquitous to you. Mm-hmm but that ubiquity doesn't translate to the people that you're talking to. And so your ability to take a step back, to imagine what it's like to come in from ground zero and build an understanding of how we're gonna approach this implementation in a way that it's gonna ensure success and the processes and the check boxes that you're willing to go through and work through to help demonstrate that is just gonna, it is, they may, you might deal with somebody who can disregard 25% of it mm -hmm. and pick up it at 25% at, at of the way down the road. And then, okay, here's what they've got. But, it, but then there's people who need it from zero. And if right. you aren't giving it to them, they're just, they're not going to have the full picture. They're not going to have the comfort or the, you know, be inspired to say, okay, these guys really have it together and I'm not going to have to spend a whole lot of calories right to to get where i need to get they're going to be they're going to move in they're going to they're going to take me where i need to go and we're going to see success fast yeah and, that's important and the other thing i would say is you know because of the virtual nature of what we're doing i think that you need to anticipate longer sales cycles it's it's just it's just it's going to be uh number one the other thing that i would say is that trust is really important and you know, you have to do the work, in my opinion, at every level of engagement to build trust with your customers. And that doesn't happen just because I say, trust me, you know, I, I have an obligation as a leader. My team has an obligation to deliver over and over and to mean what we say and say what we mean, just like you tell your kid, yep. you know, and you have to have that repetition and it takes time and you have to build trust. I mean, you know, certainly we all have relationships where we've done work with customers in previous lives. So you have some, you know, you have trust there. But in order for, I think, a solution to get ingrained and get traction, you have to anticipate who are all the stakeholders. It's not just your buyer. 
it's not just the person that, you know, has the ultimate yes decision. You need to engage at every level. So, you know, for a solution like SureTest, we have a lot of work to do at the manager and the analyst level to help people feel comfortable that this, because this solution can give you automation, it doesn't mean that your job is going to go away or we're going to, you know, your job's going to be eliminated. I mean, certainly the solution has the opportunity to reduce FTE, but we encourage our clients to think about it in terms of replacement positions or to think about it in terms of maybe they won't need to hire as many next year, but most importantly, so that they have a huge talent satisfier for these managers and analysts that now can go do more strategic work, engage with their customers, and work on projects that are going to be far more meaningful to them and their constituents. And let us take over, in this example, you know, the automation of all the testing that's so critically important. But if we don't engage above just our buyer, or the senior leadership that we're, you know, talking to about our solution, we have an obligation, in my opinion, to make those managers comfortable, to make those analysts comfortable, because yep. they're the ones, once the once the, you're signed your, your MSA and your statement of work, you know, those are the people that are really going to be able to feel the benefit and where the bottom line savings is going to come in for our clients. So engage with them, make them a part of the process. And that takes time and trust. Yeah, the sales cycle is not a small thing. I mean, what we're seeing and I know you're seeing, we've talked about it a few times, mm -hmm. uh, is, I mean, it's moved from six, eight months to 18 months. Right. I mean, it's just the reality mm -hmm. of it. And let's talk about what happen, can, can happen in 18 months, right? You start a conversation mm -hmm. with an organization. They like you. They're in some form of protracted procurement process that is, and, and inundated with a number of other priorities that they're trying to figure out with a constricted budget. And, and so you're in a conversation. And that conversation, you know, we, we always say, time kills deals. Mm -hmm. it, it is, it is a, a challenge so that the clock is ticking. What you need to do, and from a marketing perspective, an important thing to keep in mind, when from the point that that sale starts, you're in a conversation and so are other competitors. Yes. <laughs> you know, because a new competitor can launch and jump in midstream. Mm -hmm. That can happen and interrupt what you have going at any moment. So you can't assume you have to nurture and actively bring along that, that whole, and not just your primary contact, but the opportunity you have in that 18 month window mm -hmm. is to, is to build affinity throughout the organization so that you can cover as many bases as you can during that time to build the kind of relationship, the kind of assurance, the kind of stakeholder buy-in so that your the deal will fall your way it's going to take a long time you you need to use that time and not assume that just because you've got a good conversation going that it's going to find its way to close in, in that in that time period so mm -hmm. that's an important thing to keep in mind it's it is all about nurturing and really feeding that fire no i i completely agree and you also have to be patient and um i would encourage everybody don't take it personally Right. I think so many times, you know, people take it personally. Well, I had this great rapport. You know, they haven't gotten back to me. Um, you know, what I've learned over the last couple of years is the amount of of stress and challenge and competing priorities that our clients are facing are just extraordinary, really, you know, beyond any measure, like I said, that I've seen. And I work primarily with CIOs and with no slight to any of the other C-suite colleagues in the health system, but I think CIOs these days have one of the absolute hardest jobs at the C-suite. When you think about where our industry is going and all the competing priorities that they're dealing with. And I would encourage my colleagues out there on the solution side to be patient, not take things personally, and you know, always take a minute to walk a mile in their moccasins and 
what they're dealing with. Um, and I think it, I think it will give you a little pause to build that trust. And I think any, any time you come from it at the place of, are we putting our patients first? Are we focusing on quality and regulation and really caring about what our clients are facing? Mm -hmm. You will move your own window of that 18 months shorter. Um, when you're focused on the right things, in my opinion. Yeah. The more you can get to know, the more you can understand, the more you can move in their stream, the better, because you're right. I mean, we've heard it from a number of the CIOs. First of all, totally agree with you. I think that they are in <laughs> talk about the importance of discernment between competing priorities. I mean, that it is just an exceedingly difficult challenge right now. Mm -hmm. And your ability to understand what specifically their competing priorities are and frame what you're bringing mm -hmm. toward how you can help solve for X is really important yeah. because, uh, and, and understanding that, you know, they only have so many dollars and it's not enough they only have so much time and it's not enough. Right. And, and you're, <laughs> you're one of the things in their world right. that is keeping them from something else in their world that they need to do. Yeah. And, and that's hard. Yeah. It's a hard position. And I think as a solution provider, it's your job to not only connect the dots, but think about if you think about their puzzle and all the pieces that they're dealing with, where can you fit in that puzzle that might solve more than one problem, more than just your solution might be answering, you know? So for, for us, as I think about it, you know, if you think about all the application, you know, rationalization and portfolio rationalization that's going on with automation, yep. there's an opportunity to help them solve that problem as well. Not just with RPA or automating processes or automating all the testing that they need to do in regression testing, but how can you use the tool set and the library in our, in our example that we have that now has many clients in it um, to help look at best practices and, and what other puzzle pieces can your piece help impact for the problems that they're trying to solve? So it's important to understand what's on their docket globally to ask yourself, is there anything my solution can do? Or can I partner up with another solution? You know, how do we all work together yeah. to put our client at the center to help them solve some of the collective problems that they're facing? Um, and that's where I think you really begin to start becoming a partner and a strategic partner to a client and not just a staff odd vendor or a widget or a solution that they use for a period of time. And that's how you build partnership and trust over time is thinking out of the box and being creative and getting to know them and know what's, what's keeping them up at night. And, and who might we all know in the industry that might be able to help them a solution that they don't, they maybe aren't aware of that's out there. It's, you know, it's about, it's about taking the approach that everybody can win. I believe everybody can win. Yeah. And I think that that partnership element is a really great note. And it's something to consider when even in, in marketing initiatives, how can you bring a couple different entities together that have clearly complementary solutions to communicate a, a story that is compelling to an organization? You know, what can that look like? I know that you guys have worked with that yep. in the context of, of Keysight, right. right? There's, it's clearly a platform that you're, uh, that that you do well to uh, to work alongside, right. and you guys have done some combined initiatives that help simplify. <clears throat> and you know, in in a in a context where a number of health systems already own right that platform, and you're able to come in and make it more valuable. Exactly. That's a that's a great opportunity to look for uh, win 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 scenarios yep. for sure. Yep. Exactly. So knowing your broad perspective on the market and your experience and how you've seen things come forward, 
What are some of the, the trends, the solutions, the technologies that you're seeing that you've been most impressed with? You know, I, I think right now it's all about doing anything you can to help our clients be more innovative around virtual care and making sure that those solutions are well vetted, well tested, so that when the patient engages, that you know that they're engaging in the way that we need them to engage and and provide access, you know, to our patients. Um, for sure. I mean, I think at the end of the day, that's what that's what it's all about is helping our clients. Mm -hmm. And you know, for me, and maybe it's maybe it's just because I work primarily with CIOs, but helping them get a win, helping them be able to, you know, pump their own chest a little bit, because I think they need it to say, we did this innovative work. And how can what we've done help our colleagues? Um, you know, there's so many niche vendors, you know, I, you know, I really believe in Vive. And I love the platform of Vive and a lot of the new technologies that are coming to play. Um, there's so many, John, that I just think, I think it depends on what the client is trying to solve. I really do. And I think they need to be, um, they need to be thoughtful in terms of making sure that what they're buying is going to solve for the problem that that's at hand. But for, you know, from my perspective, it's, it's really around innovation. It's around automation. Obviously we're hearing, you know, a ton about AI, but I think right now what, what clients are most faced with are their provider networks and access to care and making sure that they're figuring out, you know, the virtual care landscape so they can take their own market, take more market share. Um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a fight out there for our clients. Uh, to make sure that they no keep and they retain, they retain their patients. So, um, you know, I think, I think patient engagement and alignment around provider networks and the whole interoperability play and making sure that where we can share information, we, we start to share it. I mean, I think Epic's doing some cool things. Um, um, I wasn't at UGM, but I heard a lot of folks were there and quite a bit of innovation. Um, certainly coming out of that, out of, out of UGM. Um, but. So let's talk a little bit about interoperability for a minute, because I know it is certainly an area that is um, one of the bigger challenges that we're facing and, and one of the bigger opportunities. Um, how should tech companies prioritize the data exchange and integration, how they need to communicate that, what are some of the the essentials and uh, things to hold I mean, pretty far forward? I think they need to think about regulatory first and patient experience second. And I think anything unrelated to that is is probably secondary and making sure that the alignment of where the integration is coming from is culturally, al culturally aligned with where they are and making sure that those standards are in place um, for what's opting in and, and what's opting out. But to me, first and foremost, we should be, we should be leading with regulatory and patient experience. Um, you know, we talked about this. I just went through this last week with my aunt. I know I told you she passed away and it was absolutely deplorable to me. I knew for a fact that she had had a CT scan the end of May. And I'm her healthcare proxy. I had access to her portal. I knew she had had that test. And I'm in the hospital down the street from where she had the test. And they are insisting to me, nope, she hasn't had a CT of the abdomen since 2019. That, nope, that's not accurate. When I tell you, I literally had to drive to the imaging center get a copy of the films, get the report and bring it back and have it scanned into her portal. That's a problem. That's a, That's big, a big problem. problem. And, and it happens every single day. Exactly right. Yeah. So a, yeah. I think regulatory and patient experience and those should be the drivers. Yep. That's a good, good, uh, 
good underscore there. When we think about, you know, we work with a lot of early stage companies and we see a number of very aspirational claims that they're wanting to make uh, about their enterprise readiness. So let's talk a little bit about enterprise readiness, because I'm sure that you've seen some different uh, <laughs> different things about how organizations, how companies have approached that and with some, some wins and losses. Mm -hmm. But what, when, when somebody is interested, when an organization's interested in truly being enterprise ready, mm -hmm. what does that mean? And what do they need to be considering in, in how they're communicating their abilities and what actually is manifest? I mean, I think that they need to do the work to make sure that they have all the compliance and security cornerstones of the building. Uh, in place so that a health system is completely comfortable that if there's an intersection between that infrastructure, that their patients are not going to be put at any risk. So from my perspective, that's first and foremost. You have to be able to very clearly demonstrate that you're aware of the compliance issues, you're aware of the regulatory requirements, that you can demonstrate that you have a strong and secure um, infrastructure, um, and that you can be an extension of, of protecting their patients. So, you know, you have to be able to very easily, there's a questionnaires that all of our clients send to every solution provider. Um, make sure you can honestly and ethically answer all those questions. And if you can't spend the money to put in place what you need to put in place in order to serve you know, our clients at, at the enterprise level. Yeah. We, we hear this often. You can't afford a failed implementation. Correct. It just doesn't, doesn't do you. There's too much competition there. There's too many people talk to too many people in this field. If you, uh, if you end up falling down on, a, on, on us, when you're trying to stand it up, you're, it's going to get I mean, it's going to get found out and it's going to, it's going to really hurt you. I mean, John, you know, this about SureTest. you know, we were very purposeful in our, in our, in our growth, right? We, we started with three pilot clients. We wanted to make sure that we knew we could deliver. We were careful in how we scaled our growth. Um, we had the opportunity to bring on more clients faster and we wanted to make absolute sure that our frameworks and our libraries and the way that we approach the automation to really deliver speed to value was rock solid. And we took the time that we had to take to have absolute confidence to then take it to the market in a big way. And, you know, obviously you helped us along that, along that journey. Um, but you don't double your growth year over year without spending money to make sure that you have put the controls and the quality in place. And quite frankly, even hiring ahead of demand to make sure that you will not slip up in terms yep. of the delivery. The only, thing, the, the only thing more expensive than doing what you need to do to get, in, to get where you need to get in that realm is not doing it. Exactly right. And you, you know, because it's, it's not doing it will be the failure of your organization exactly. or close to it. And, it. and it's hard, right? You have to choose where you spend your money, especially, you know, when you're an, a new company, um, you know, SureTest celebrates its, its third year as a totally separate standalone company. We've been doing this for years before, obviously, as a part of a, a another company in a business unit, but as a standalone company, we're about to hit our, um, our third year. And there's things that you do in the first six months, in the first year, in the second year. And, you know, by the time you get to year, year three, you, if you've spent the right of money, right amount, right, amount of, right amount of money in terms of building out your infrastructure, getting the right talent on board, leveraging the tools that you need in order to get your message to market, you know, documenting your message and testing your methodology you know, then you can really begin, you know, you can really begin to soar. And, you know, we would not have been able to have, you know, 100% growth year over year without that investment. And you have to be willing yep. to make it. You can't, you can't do it on a shoestring and do it well. 
Yeah. It, and so something to camp out, camp out on here for just a second is what that means in the context of marketing, right? Because how are we, how are you going to explain and inspire and demonstrate the kind of, the kind of confidence that you have in what, how you're going to make this happen? How do you bring that across? I mean, a part, a part of it is with very well articulated case studies that, that with, with customers who are willing to stand up on your behalf and say, yeah, they're the real deal. And this was a, this was a waltz, you know, this was, re this really w went well and exceeded my expectations mm -hmm. for how we would implement it. And the results have been fantastic. Right. Now the, the trick is you really need that backdrop, you know, it, you, you need those clients. And so it is really worth investing, especially for those companies who are on the early stage of this. I, Laura, I know with SureTest, mm -hmm. You guys bent over backwards in those first clients that you had to make sure, right? right? Uh, well, to, to make sure that they were well served. Well, because honestly, you knew the value yeah, of that. Yeah, and honestly, for me, John, personally, you know, you know how I feel about my clients. We're gonna we bend over for every client because my goal is to sure. have a hundred percent referenceable clients. So, you know, certainly and, in those early in those early first clients, as we were working things out. I agree with you. It was, it was increasingly important. But as I think back to the day when we did our discovery session, you have a term for it. I forget what you call it. What's it called when we do that? Productized uh, onboarding? Yeah. The whole session where we literally lock ourselves in a room and get challenged to make sure that we have heard our clients and that we Oh, you're talking about the buyer matrix. Yeah, the buyer, matrix, the buyer matrix that piece. we have packaged our messaging well and that from that buyer matrix everything builds on it right so you make sure that you have your client testimonials you have your white papers you have your quotes from your clients that's a hard thing to get from clients these days again it's not personal they're busy so to my earlier point it's about trust it's about making sure your clients feel like they're winning and you know are really getting something out of your solution so they feel compelled to give you that white paper or to give you that reference. And it, it takes time, it takes energy, it takes marketing dollars to keep them engaged. And it's an important journey. And it's almost like, you know, just like we talk about our library, like Lincoln Logs and, and Legos and why that framework is so efficient. It's the same thing with this when you think about the methodology of launching a company and getting it from where we were to where we are now, you have to think about where are all those little Lego pieces that you need to stack up simultaneously to make sure that you get to the end game. There's and you have to have a plan. It doesn't you don't you can't just wing that. Yeah, no doubt. It is, it is really important. And, you know, I, what I know is uh, for you personally, I know every client is a first client. And, and I think the thing that, that is important to keep in mind, it does take to get that, to get that flywheel rolling. It does take some initial really intentional hard work on the front end to build those stories and, and ensure that you have them. It gets easier the more you do because you, those methodologies become more sure. Mm -hmm. They become more well founded. You get the you get the process rolling, but you can't afford to assume knowledge and understanding on the part of those clients. They need to be shown. They need to be told. They need to, they need friends that they know that have implemented it, or at least people they recognize and respect that they can look at and say, "Okay, if they did it, I can call them up and ask." Right. Right. And when and and the, that's just so important in the space. Um, yep. And I know and, you've heard Mark Scruggs, our president, say, um, you know, my colleague for a long, long time, you know, it's the law of three, six, ten. Right. You need your first three. Then you have six. You know, then you have 10 clients. You know, we're well past that for us. But once you get those 10 clients and you've done all that work to set up a, um, a machine right to, to yep. get those references you know then your solution will start to get so much energy i think in the market and people will begin to talk about it and i think you also have to be comfortable i'm a firm believer like the most disarming thing you can say to another person is is i need your help and if you've taken the time to do right by your clients 
to deliver quality, to measure the ROI, to show them I mean what I say and I say what I mean. I think you earn the right to go to that client and say, hey, you know, I need your help. And will you be a reference for me? And will you talk to so-and-so? And And if you've done your part and you built that trust, at least my clients say, sure, Laura, happy to help. And that's where you want to get to. That takes energy and time. And, you know, and it's a process. It it comes down to something we talk about all the time in the context of ratio. You, it's really important as you approach the market that you are not jumping into the hero seat. Mm -hmm. You are really working hard to hand the hero seat, the, the, to assign your client, the role of the hero, Yep. you know, who you're selling into, they need to know that you're going to make them a hero. Exactly right. And because when the, the minute you make them a hero, you make them an advocate of yours. And, and they deserve it. They're the one that's made the decision. <laughs> hey, I'm going to take a chance on this innovation. I believe in this. And they, then they deserve it. I mean, we, we do QBRs, quarterly business reviews with all of our clients. And um, Mark and Steve are on uh, right now flying to, to go see one. And I looked at the deck and I was just so happy to see that the main portion of the deck was, yeah, here's the dashboards. Here's all the metrics. Here's all the things we've done. But at the end of the day, bravo to our client sponsor. In this case, um, her name is Nikki. But bravo. Way to go, Nikki. Way to go, Nikki. Right from SA. Bravo to her because she has led this innovation with us. And she has engaged. She has um, told us what she thought. She has listened. She has helped us, you know, solve problems. If, so, if we needed a quick answer and somebody wasn't responding, whatever. But she's the hero. She should be the one that gets to stand up and say, what used to take us 20,000 hours a year is no more. And we yep. use that for this, this, and this. And the client deserves the credit. We're, we're just a, we're a little piece of the, the, the puzzle to help get them there, but they, they yeah. deserve the credit. You know, one of the things that I appreciate about Laura O'Toole is that, I mean, you just heard her passion around this. She's, she's a big chunk of why she does what she does is because there is, uh, there are lives to be saved. There are people to help along the care path. And <clears throat> there are people, there are providers, clinicians working every day to make that possible and struggling to, to make that happen. And when we can relieve part of that burden, I mean, there's, there's no better story than uh, the opportunity to help in that process. It's what, why Ratio does what we do and why we're excited to be in, in, in the part in the partner with organizations like SureTest to help see that happen. But, um, you know, I know that that's a big part of your, uh, your heartbeat, Laura. I appreciate you for that. Um, kind of, kind of tied to that, you know, I, I, I know that we are in this crazy era right now of the, the birth of generative AI. Mm-hmm. Um, I know it's an area you spent some time and looked at. I know that a big part of what you're doing has to do with automation and, uh, and, you know, turning a lot of, uh, trust and control over to quote unquote, the machine. Mm -hmm. Um, and so talk to some about the ethical considerations that we're looking at now. Mm -hmm. Um, what, what, how, how have you, uh, you know, knowing that healthcare is an industry where ethical considerations are paramount, what do tech companies need to be aware of and align with regarding guidelines? How, how do we need to be looking at that stuff? Well, you know, again, I think it goes down to regulatory and patient experience and always keeping the patient safe and making sure that the measures around quality that remain stay intact with with solutions that are ai based and and you know i i gotta say i use chat gpt now every day administratively i would say it 
I, I do something with it every day. It helps me think of a phrase or, you know, there's a host of things that we use it for. Um, I think there's for a company like SureTest, there's a real opportunity. I mean, you know, our one of the things I love about our library is that if we have a client that comes on board and they are doing a particular workflow and 50 steps and we know we have another client de-identified in our library that's doing it in 20 steps, you know, we want to be able to share that best practice with our client. There is an opportunity for an AI component to help us get there faster for our clients. And we're using that and we will use that. But at the same time, there's boundaries and guardrails around everything. And when it comes to patient care, I think there's a tremendous opportunity in terms of helping providers with information that AI can be a catalyst for. I think there needs to be measure and guardrails around making sure that we're not letting AI take the place of those critical components that someone feels or if even a physician's hunch by some of the things that they've seen in their career. Um, once they look at all the data, they've got experiences. You can't take away people's experiences and how valuable experience is, I think, in relation to AI. So I, my, my, my hope and encouragement for this technology is that it gives us a boost. It gives us a layup. It's like a piggyback, but it, it's, it's not every, it's not everything. And we need sure. to have caution. And I think we have a fiscal responsibility, an ethical responsibility. Every one of us that uses AI needs to be completely comfortable in the mode that we're using it and in the environment that we're using it and that it's only going to be for the betterment and not do harm. And I think yep. the ethics come into place if you're continually asking yourself that question you know, making sure you're balancing the regulatory and quality requirements that exist in our industry. Yeah, probably worth underscoring. I think it's it's a important endeavor right now for any health tech company and any healthcare organization that is using or touching AI to frame a policy around it. Exactly. That is that is clearly articulated. That has uh, that lets people know how you are viewing and how you are using the technology. What are the guardrails you've established for your organization, for your company, that you're going to abide by, right. and and put that out there so that people can see, know, understand, and learn from it. Because that's an important thing. We have to help people know how to think about this. We have to let them know how we're addressing it. And uh, I think that that's that's a critical component something and something I know is in process in a lot of organizations, right. a few that I know of that have established it and something that I think we all need to be thinking about in some form or fashion. And any of us who are touching, uh, you know, patient care need to be aware of. Um, Laura, just real quick, as we conclude here, I, I have a couple of curiosities. I know that what, the, the channels that you're tuned into are many of the same channels a number of our provider uh, providers are tuned into. Who, what are you, where are you learning from? What are some of the conferences, the, the media channels, the publications that you are, are taking in regularly? Yeah, I mean, so for me, I obviously, I think LinkedIn has actually gotten a, a ton better in terms of even the articles that are out there. I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm an avid reader of, of, you know, the Wall Street Journal and Harvard Business Review, but certainly I think Vive has done a great job. I Becker's, I mean, I'm, I'm, these these are publications and, and articles that I engage with on a daily basis. Um, I think, as you know, we've gotten really ingrained with Bill Russell and This Week Health. Um, I love his 
his story and I love his mission. I mean, his goal is to leave his career making, you know, healthcare technology leaders better and to bring up the next set of leaders and to make sure that they're educated with what's happening in our industry day in and day out. Um, I think he does a great job of that. I listen to his podcast all the time. I'm, I'm involved a lot in his podcast. Um, so that's another area. I mean, I get modern healthcare electronically. I certainly read that, um, you know, all the time. Um, but that's probably where I spend uh, the majority of my, my reading and engagement right now, John. Gotcha. Awesome. So if you have not already, as you've been listening to this, you want to go visit suretest.health and learn what uh, Laura and her team are up to to help automate the whole, uh, help automate healthcare in a lot of different ways. Um, but certainly around the uh, EHR and testing realm, that is where their, their primary focus on and they have a lot of opportunities to help a lot of automate a lot of the administrative functions around um, around healthcare. Uh, it's super exciting work that they're doing. Uh, Laura, where else can uh, listeners follow you? You just said you're very yeah, I'm pretty, uh, I'm, very active in the LinkedIn. Yeah, realm. I'm, I'm pretty active on uh, on LinkedIn. Obviously, my contact. We're a pretty transparent organization. All my contact information is out on our on our website and. You know, uh, L, you know, LO tool at suretest.health. Love to engage. And, and I mean this very sincerely for any companies that are where we were, you know, three, four years ago. Um, I'm all about trying to help my colleagues um, win. And I, I believe we can all win, especially when um, you're focused on the right things and you care about healthcare and you're really putting your clients and most importantly, our patients at the center. Yeah. Part of the reason Laura's here, part of the reason she's a part of our advisory board, part of the reason I call her a friend is because she is a sincere uh, human being who cares. And Laura, thank you for the investment you're, you're making in, in our healthcare ecosystem. Thank you for, uh, for your sincerity and the willingness to come here today and, and share some of your backdrop and experience. I know there's going to be a lot of value that comes from it. Well, thanks, John. It's always, always great to be with you.